that uh, Japanese flute that we just listened to, ideally should be listened to in complete silence. Because that kind of music is not about the sounds, it's about the silence. It's about the gaps between the sounds the underlying field out of which the sounds come, into which each sound returns. And when you pay attention to that, one could almost say you become more interested in what's not there than in what is there. <laughs> you become more interested in nothing than something. And the same can happen when you walk in nature, here or anywhere. And although you acknowledge the beauty and you perceive the beauty of all these forms around you, and yet you are aware of something beyond and deeper that is actually not separate from the beauty of these forms that you see, life forms, not separate from it, but deeper, an underlying unity, a field. I'm using words for something that one cannot describe, of course, so just little signposts. And when you pay attention to that, in one, one entry point is to say that you listen to the silence. Now, strictly speaking, you can't really listen to silence because there's nothing there to listen to. So, what that really means is there is a state of attention that arises. Attention, not tension. A state of attention Because that is the moment you pay attention to the absence of sound, the nothingness, either in between two sounds or the, f the field that is there even while the sound is there. There's the underlying field, one could say, the canvas on which the music is painted or the canvas on which all the sense perceptions are painted. And the same when you watch, when you see a picture, you're rarely aware of the canvas, you're only aware of what's on it. So we can shift awareness to an, the underlying field. So when we go into nature, we say, be aware of a, f a field of stillness that's all, despite the sounds here and there, there's a field of stillness all around, but it's an alive stillness. It's not the kind of dead stillness you would get in a sound studio. There's an alive stillness all around. And that's the background to all of which you see. And that is the dimension when you sense that, one could also say it, that is the totality in which everything appears a larger wholeness. And when you sense that, pay attention to that, automatically thought activity subsides. Because all thought is to do with form and content. Thought itself is a mental noise. 
And so usually you're drawn into identification with the thoughts, sense perceptions, thoughts. And so here, the moment you tune into that level, you cannot think and be aware of that underlying dimension of silence. In our or you could put it, you cannot think and listen to silence. <laughs> this is why it becomes a portal for you to simply, as if you were listening to silence, then there is an attention there that is not thinking, just an alertness. And what is that? Awareness prior to thought. The awareness, the field that is there before thought and after thought. There's that thoughtless awareness. Beautiful. It's still, but very conscious. And you could even, while you listen to these words, they are the words, and there's the gaps between the words. And you may come to a point, as somebody said to me at the last retreat, after two or three days, he or she, I don't remember, said, I'm beginning to enjoy those times when you sit there and don't speak, almost more than when you speak. And that, when that happens to you, it's working. I'm not needed anymore. That means it's working. <laughs> so here, now, there isn't complete silence here because we have various devices, machines, living in this civilization, that's how it is. We have all kinds of machines that make little noises. <laughs> Projector, camera, fans, whatever, this, that's how it is. And yet, you can still pay attention to the gaps between the words, that arise naturally. And what is there when there's gaps between words? And you're aware of the gaps. There's inner stillness. You're aware of the absence of the words, the gaps, and there's a stillness. Hmm. So that's the state of no mind. Thoughtless awareness or presence. And that also means, I call it presence, because you're completely in the now, in that state. You're, whenever thought occurs, thought is always connected with past or future. 
even if you're thinking about something that's happening now, your thoughts about it are words which come from the past or are interpretations which are to do with the conditioning of your mind. But most of the time you're not even thinking about what's happening now. Most thought is about concerned with past or future. Never fully alive to this moment. Never fully or very rarely, that is a normal state, very rarely fully present with your attention in this aliveness, this fullness that is fullness and emptiness at the same time, the fullness of life that is now Because the mind is waiting for a better moment than this one, where the mind-created entity, the me, is going to fulfill itself. Where the mind-created entity, the me, is going to add more to itself, and it's trying to get there. And while I don't speak here, see if you can, d so to speak, dwell in that state of simple awareness. And you may find that your entire body is permeated by a sense of aliveness in that state. You're actually inhabiting your body with your attention. Your attention is not only out there, it's also within. It's a, a sense of presence which is everywhere. And you are that. See if you can just dwell in that and hold it without effort. You may find as you first, as you hold it, a particular part of your body, you may feel that more strongly than any other part of the body, the aliveness. It could be the simple thing of your hands, an aliveness within, very subtle at first. And to anybody who cannot feel it, and you can do this whenever you tell people about the importance of inhabiting the body, people who may not be ready to listen to anything else, but who are tortured by their minds, as most people are, when you ask them, close your eyes, hold your right or left hand like this. Is there any way in which you can find out without looking and without moving your hand whether your right hand is still there? That's a silly question, but it works. Is there any way you can find out whether your right hand is still there? You're not looking, not moving it, not touching anything. And so what happens when that question is asked? Your attention moves into the hand. <laughs> and suddenly you feel an aliveness there. <laughs> that means you've entered the body with your attention. That same aliveness, you can then, f once you know what that means, because there are people who don't know what I'm talking about when I say sense the inner body. Perhaps they have lived for years and years only in the head, completely identified with thought. 
once you can feel the hand, that can remain, becomes an anchor so that you're not, your mind is not always, it loses some power, the power to draw your attention in continuously with every little thought. It absorbs, it always absorbs your entire consciousness and it, all your consciousness becomes thought. Everything is immediately transformed into form, unaware of the formless, the dimension of the unmanifested or the formless. So as you sit here, you can sense a generalized feeling of aliveness. If you can feel your hand, you can also feel the aliveness in your feet and legs. And then all over the body, subtle. But it's there, so you rest in that. When I talk about it, it still sounds as if there were a duality, that you are observing those feelings. But after a while you realize that's only because of language. It's actually part of the sense of presence. Is it's your pres your the sense of presence is all over. It's an entire body phenomenon. So that you sink into that feeling. You become one with it. You are it. There's such vast intelligence in the body. DNA, every cell has its own, it's, is its own manifestation of intelligence. Far greater than the mind, the thinking mind. You cannot control the functions of your body with your thinking mind. Hundreds or thousands of things simultaneously would have to be coordinated every m second. <laughs> it's impossible. How do you circulate your blood? How you do you digest your food? How do you, whatever these organs perform, keep the body at always the same temperature? How do you make the cells reproduce themselves continuously? How do you, oh, there's so much, I can't keep up. You would have to use the most powerful computers and they would break down, to even keeping the body alive for two seconds. <laughs> and that's the human body. It's an expression in form of vast intelligence. Of course, it's only a form, it is short-lived. And the reality of who you are goes far beyond that manifestation of it. What you see and feel externally is the manifestation, an appearance in form that comes and goes. It's like a smoke almost, or a soap bubble, or whatever, anything, any analogy, metaphor, whatever, whatever work is short-lived existence and then dissolves. like a. That's how the body is. It doesn't live for that long. I'm always amazed when I look at old films that show people in a big city, like say in the 20s, they were running around the streets. And they're all pursuing such important aims. They're all dead now. <laughs> and they've been replaced by other people running around the streets. <laughs> In Europe, you can get an even more of a sense of that because the cities are very old. Almost every building is old. And so there are generations and generations and generations that inhabit the same buildings. And they come and then they melt away and then another generation inhabits these streets and buildings and runs around them, and then it's gone. And every little life thought, this is my, it's so important what I'm doing. Yes, it's relatively important but not absolutely important. 
It's relatively important whether you succeed or fail in the eyes of the world. It's relatively important whether you're healthy or not healthy. It's relatively important whether you are rich or poor. It makes some difference in your life. Relatively important whether you're educated or uneducated. It's all on the level of your form identity. Yes, it matters. But it doesn't matter that there is something that matters more than any of those things, and that is knowing who you are beyond that short-lived entity, that short-lived personalized sense of self. Jesus said that in the story of Martha and Mary, Martha being anxious about getting everything done, must get this done, this matters, so it's so important, and Mary just listened to Jesus. <laughs> and Martha said, why don't you tell her to help me? And Jesus said, there are many things, but only one thing that truly matters. And she has chosen that one thing. I assume that Mary was in a state of thoughtless awareness. That's why he said it. She was listening. When you know you're truly listening, you're in that state. There's no true listening that is not the state of thoughtless awareness because everything else is a mental commentary. As every therapist knows, every therapist who is effective, eventually, sometimes only after years and years of applying learned and acquired knowledge, something else takes over and they become simple. And when the client comes, they listen. Truly listen. And immediately a higher intelligence is operating. And that does the work. Occasionally words may come. They come out of that state of attention, attentive listening. So we are concerned with this activation of that higher intelligence here. That then, at first, it seems a passive thing that we are doing, just becoming aware of silence, paying attention to gaps. But as this becomes activated in you, you see that it can, it begins to run your life. You live from there, not anymore from here. You can still use this up here, but you live from a wholeness. So the body is short-lived, and there is some there is an aliveness there it it is an expression of the one consciousness appearing as a temporary form and that in itself is beyond time so to sense the body is an entry point into connecting with who you truly are it's a return journey We've had the journey outward for a long, long time into fragmentation, more and more thought, noise, getting lost in the world, getting lost out there, losing yourself. The famous story of the prodigal son, the lost son, who leaves home with wealth, squanders all his wealth, and then loses himself out there. And then at some point, he begins to travel back home. So it's a, we are coming home, really, to ourselves, not the conditioned self. That which 
reveals itself as yourself a simple sense of I amness, not the little meanness, a simple sense of beingness or presence, which is the, the thoughtless awareness. That has nothing to do with your story. The only relationship that it has with your life story and your personalized sense of identity is that through all the ups and downs and sufferings of your personalized sense of self, you've come to this point of realization. It's mm -hmm. taken you here. In that sense, it all worked. Even though it might seem, from a conventional perspective, that your life hasn't worked. Very few lives actually seem to work truly. And there are very few people who have that feeling that my life actually worked out the way it was supposed to. It's all gone wonderfully. Many young people still have that idea, of course. <laughs> and then things happen. Oh, as somebody said to my mother, she told a woman, very wealthy woman, not my mother, that woman, very wealthy woman but unhappy, said, I never imagined my life to have turned out that way. That was not what I imagined my life to be when I was young. And so she is very unhappy because of the gap between the early imagination of how her life would be that survived in her head, and it didn't, life didn't conform to that early fantasy. But the early fantasy remains in the head and remains the criterion by which they judge their present life. And the present life doesn't conform to that fantasy. <laughs> and so they're unhappy. <laughs> I know a woman who is doing wonderful work. She's a teacher at school. She has incredible empathy with children. That is obviously her life mission. She has changed too many children's lives. In poor part children, disadvantaged children, and, and wonderful work. And, but she has an idea in her head of how her life should have turned out, and now that idea says, I'm only a school teacher. This wasn't supposed to happen. I was going to be an actress. And there's great unhappiness because she can't fully see what she's doing and she's looking still to fulfill the fantasy, to get rid of the unhappiness. <laughs> it's a conceptualized way of living, of having some, living with an image, an idealized me, an idealized story in the head. And one day she called me and said, I'm dreadfully depressed. I said, why? I applied to do a commercial on TV as a starting point for my ca acting career, and I even got uh, invited to the, what? Yes. And she was turned down. <laughs> my life has come to an end. <laughs> that wasn't the story that was meant to happen. A conceptualized sense of self, and this is what almost everybody is burdened with in the head, the storyline of me. And life always throws something in there to make it go not quite right. Occasionally you can get control of it, and it's great when it works, you, you're getting what you want. That happens too. You wanted the big house and the big car and the career, and you did, you made it. But in there, again, there will be something that wasn't meant to happen. Oh, not like that. 
There was a film one or two years ago about a man who meets a beautiful woman who turns out to be the devil, and she grants him six or seven or whatever wishes, and every wish is an idealized story of me, and each one turns out to be dreadful. At first he gets what he wants, but there's always something in there that, that uh, makes it a failure. It <laughs> It, it's amazing, there's an amazing truth in there because no matter what you do and where you go, you will encounter, there's always a polarity to any situation. There isn't the one fulfilling, permanently fulfilling situation that you can find. Wherever any situation you go into, any relationship that you have, any person you meet, place you live, what job you get, recognition from the, wo the, the world telling you you're important, and you will always taste the other polarity. There's something in there that, no, that wasn't. So there's always the two whenever you look at any situation. The, the Buddha says this, oh, wherever you go, you will find some suffering. <laughs> But only if you look to a situation to satisfy you, if you look to a relationship, to a situation to fulfill your sense of self, to fulfill you, if you look to a place, a situation, a person, a circumstance, a condition to fulfill you, to enhance and deepen your sense of who you are, sense of rootedness, of beingness, then it won't satisfy you. For a moment, a little while it can, and then something will come up. Oh, no. In the midst of the very desirable situation, <laughs> there's always another side to it. You may get so famous that you can't go out in the street anymore. There's a riot whenever you walk and could do your shopping. You lost all your freedom and you thought, when I become a star, my life will be fulfilled. Can't even go out anymore. That wasn't supposed to happen. <laughs> and then all these people who come and want something from you, want to be near you, are they really interested in me, you wonder? Or is it all false? Mm. Can you, and then you have to look hard to find anybody real. <laughs> it's just one little example. And we know it with relationships. The ideal man and the ideal woman turns out not to be the ideal man or the ideal woman. So to have an expectation of phenomenal, the phenomenal world to do something for you, ultimately the expectation is that you will find yourself in or through a situation, a condition, a person, something out there that somehow that fulfillment you will find your fulfillment, yourself, through that. And then life becomes a very frustrating thing because the world cannot give you that. <laughs> and if you don't know it, that any situation is short-lived, it comes to an end, or it no longer satisfies you, satisfies you because something else happens in it. Oh. When you don't know it, it's very frustrating, this life. <laughs> Nothing ever seems to work out. It's not really meant to work out. <laughs> it's very liberating to see that, that the story and that conceptualized sense of self, an image in the mind, 
but that is never satisfying. It's always frustrating. <laughs> so we step out of that. When you see it, you can allow the world to be the way it is without expecting something from it that it cannot give you, and that is yourself. And then, when you, the expectation is dropped, you become present suddenly to now. And then you can go into situations without the expectation that says, please fulfill me. <laughs> Any situation, which is, it could be a new relationship, a new place to live, a new job, a new this, a new that, please fulfill me. You d when you don't do that anymore, you accept the way it is right now with the, tr the polarity that it has. There's always up, down, good, bad and you accept it for what it is. It's fine. And you move to a new city or a new big house. It's fine. I don't expect anything from that, I'm not looking for myself in that, because something will come up to spoil your pleasure. <laughs> And suddenly, the world becomes a satisfying place. <laughs> because you don't expect to be satisfied by it anymore. <laughs> and suddenly, this moment becomes a satisfying place to be. Because the illusion that at some future point things are going to improve and I will find myself through this or that has gone away. So this is through seeing that, that through attaining in the future, you won't find yourself anywhere in the future in any situation and suddenly, what's the alternative? You look around, where do I go from here? This looks it's all very depressing. <laughs> that means anything I do is really pointless, isn't it? So what's the point in doing anything? Uh, that's the mind still trying to work something out. And suddenly you you discover something long forgotten, and that is this moment, the now. Because until now, the now had been a stepping stone to the future, a means to an end, reduced to that. And you, if you look back, you will see that almost everything you did was a means to an end. <laughs> because you were hoping for the, the full point in the future, the fulfilling point to be reached, to complete yourself and your, st your story in the head. <laughs> and now, the now suddenly is no longer a means to an end. You become aware of the now as it is. It's not in the service of a mentally projected future or a mentally projected self. The now is sufficient unto itself, and you discover how liberating it is to acknowledge the now. Miraculous, truly miraculous. Everything is. That little leaf moving in the wind.
don't imagine that a life that continuously misses the one vital dimension in your life missed continuously because you're looking for it somewhere else. <laughs> Oh my God. <laughs> so, this is truly awakening. And you awaken into now. Now. In many cases, the now, as judged through external appearances, may not be such a wonderful, desirable place when you look at it through the mind that says, well, here I am stuck in this boring job behind a desk. Every day is the same. Or here I am not enough money in this place that's not nice to live in. Here I am with a body that is not healthy. Here I am living with a wife or husband that's making me unhappy, stuck. But if I leave him or her, who knows, my situation might be even worse, so I'd better stick around. The external appearance of the now may not always appear to be a good place. You may be in prison. You may be listening to this tape in prison. <laughs> and I'm not trying to convince you that you are in a good place. or say, it's not so bad after all, just you'll get out eventually. In the state of presence, There's something there that is greater than the forms that appear in your life. Vaster, greater. That is why many people who realized this, realized it precisely when their life circumstances were very unfavorable, dreadful, in fact. And suddenly they realized a deeper dimension of incredible power and aliveness, and they perhaps were surrounded by prison walls and barred windows. And suddenly they discovered incredible aliveness flooding the entire being. But they only got there because they reached a point of no longer running away from this moment that seemed so unacceptable. And nothing would be more normal than to run away from an unacceptable situation, run away from it internally, try, if only, fantasy world. If you can't get out of prison, at least you can create a fantasy world. So you're running away from it, and you're resisting it, and you're creating great unhappiness through resisting whatever is at this moment. And so those people, perhaps a prisoner, suddenly gave up the resistance to the now. Suddenly gave up trying to run to some mentally created future. When they let me out in 10 years, I'll be fine. And with the 
letting go of resistance to now came the liberation from external circumstances, inner liberation. And the liberation from the conditioning of the mind. And suddenly there was a peace, an alive peace. They're still in the same place. What's happened? Well, simple. They might not even have known it. What happened? You surrendered to this moment. You surrendered to life. You stopped saying no. That's what happened. <laughs> it's simple. That's, that's all. That's what happened. Is it that simple? Why didn't I do this before? My whole career as a criminal was unnecessary. I'm talking about the person in prison. They <laughs> because even in his criminal activities, he was looking for himself, where he could never find himself. And he thought other people were obstacles to finding himself. Maybe he even killed somebody. Or he robbed banks. Surely, if I have enough money through that, I will find myself. <laughs> so that's what happened, and then it happened to some people with life-threatening illness, great unhappiness, and suddenly a shift. <sighs> what happened? You said yes to this moment. Is that all? Maybe if I had done it ten years ago, there would have been no illness. But it's never too late. And miraculous possibilities of transformation are there when you align yourself totally with this moment. If healing, in the case of somebody who is ill, if healing is possible at all, it will happen. And I've seen many cases of people becoming healed through Complete surrender to what is. This is not resignation. I'm not saying it is not the surrender that says, okay, I'll better resign myself to the fact that I'm ill and that I'm not going to make it. <laughs> no, that's not, that's not it. There's a mental projection. There's a conceptual image of me as an ill person. <laughs> and some egos hang on even to that. Because if nobody has given me much attention when I was healthy, at least now they're giving me attention. And some egos need that. It's the only way they can get some attention. All these doctors are giving me attention, these important people. <laughs> it's working. I'm somebody. <laughs> <laughs> Not every illness is like that, but it is an aspect that you can often observe in certain people. So this is not the resignation that says, okay, I'm ill, there's nothing I can do. No, that's not, surrender is, so you surrender to this moment, not a concept in your head that you resign yourself to. You surrender to what is at this moment. And what is it that is, here I am, and there may be certain feelings there may be a certain disability, there may be a certain pain somewhere in the body. It may even be an illness that you can't yet feel, and yet they've told you that you're very ill. But this is what is. There's, there's the disability. I can't walk properly anymore, whatever the disability is, there it is this moment, not projecting myself and saying, okay, it's not going to change, you might as well accept that. <laughs> That's future projection. Simply, the isness of this moment. It is. And then you grow from there. Every moment. 
And I've seen occasionally people with serious disabilities that they've had for years, and I've looked into their eyes occasionally, in, and in some of them I saw great unhappiness and dreadful burden of having to live in that way. A very unhappy sense of self, very understandable that you should be complaining inside when all the people around you seem to be okay and fit and walking everywhere and you can't move without assistance. It's so understandable that you become an unhappy self. And then I've seen a few and looked into their eyes and see a light shining, an absence of an unhappy entity. They were simply looking. No complainer anymore inside. No complaining entity that says, why me? And so on. And builds a st an identity around the illness, the disability. There has been acceptance of the unacceptable and the shift happened. <gasps> Surrender happened. I saw this man, this is an interesting uh, story, at when I was a st graduate student. I never finished my graduate studies, but it be, it's, and transformation happened, and uh, that was it. <laughs> 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 so the, the PhD never happened. <laughs> but there was this man where I was used to go to eat every lunchtime at the university in the graduate center. They would wheel in a man in this wheelchair, and he was always surrounded by several people, and one person would get his food, and another person would feed him, because he couldn't move any limb, and he, another person had to hold up his head, and, and somebody else was holding a napkin under his chin, and then the food had to be put in his mouth. And when I first arrived there, I saw him, I asked, who is this? And they said, he's a teacher. He teaches here, and he has this incurable illness, and they've given him two years to live, and uh, these are his graduate students, and he could only produce croaking sounds, and there was always one or two people who could interpret what he was saying. <laughs> and one day he came into the building downstairs, and I opened the door for him, and he came wheeling in his wheelchair, and he looked at me, and I looked at him, and I was surprised by the absence of unhappiness in him. There was no unhappy me there, just looking. And that was just a few seconds, and I saw there something happened, he surrendered. And then I left the university, and just many years later, maybe 10 years later, I saw in an, at a newsstand the cover of Newsweek magazine, and there he was on the cover of Newsweek magazine in his wheelchair, and the headline said, Master of the Universe. <laughs> so he had, bec he had become the most famous physicist in the world, and he was still around after they'd given him two years to live, ten years before. And he produced creative thinking. His thought processes hadn't come to an end, no, not yet. But there was no longer a self associated with his thought processes from having to think. So you can see how what this, first of all, the predictions didn't come true. It was a miracle that he continued to live. <laughs> and then it was a miracle that somebody like that could become, could make such a contribution. No complaining entity was left in him. He couldn't have survived if there had been a continuing conceptual sense of self complaining about the universe. 
and itself. And then I read the interview in that magazine, and one thing he said there, I remembered one s statement he made in the interview about his life, and he said, who could wish for more? <laughs> he now speaks through some mechanical device. Who could wish for more? <laughs> so whatever your situation, miraculous things happen when the uncompromising yes to what is arises in you. Because you see the futility and the madness of not aligning yourself with what is. And you see it so completely. And so there comes the uncompromising, uncompromising yes. Even if it seems unacceptable, it's yes, it is, it is. The first person who write to write to me from prison, in the meantime I've had a few more letters from prison of people who read the book, who understood the meaning of surrender, of inhabiting the body. And the first person who wrote to me soon after the book came out said, I'm practicing the teaching, my life is transformed and I'm teaching other prisoners. And I have another 15 years to do here and it's okay. My life is transformed. And last year he got out. Nobody knows why. He wasn't even eligible for parole. I don't know the details of it. <laughs> <laughs> Somehow he got out. <laughs> I'm not asking how. <laughs> but his happiness no longer depended on it. That's why it happened. His fulfillment no longer depended on it. <laughs> Jesus said all the same things. Seek only the kingdom of heaven, which is within, which is now, here and now, not there, not then, here and now, seek only the kingdom of heaven. I actually believe he said, find the kingdom of heaven. And all the other things that you thought you needed will be added unto you. The things that you thought you needed didn't really need to be yourself. You just thought you needed them they will be added. Oh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> it's not a big deal anymore. You appreciate it, but it's no longer that, you know, the, I've made it, I made it. It doesn't, that doesn't happen anymore. It's, oh, it's, this is nice. Of course it won't last either. Nothing lasts. So here, the key word perhaps this afternoon is uncompromising, the uncompromising yes, no matter what it is. You don't make a deal with life that says, okay, if you give me this and that, then I'll say yes. It's, is it a deal? No, it won't work. No matter what, I say yes to what is. Just now, this moment. And whenever the shift occurs from the state of no to the state of yes, 
That is surrender. Surrender is the shift from the inner denial and resistance to this moment to the openness and the embracing and the yes to this moment. And that we call surrender. Now that shift you may have to go through many times even in one day because you will be able to detect more and more quickly within yourself the state of non-surrender, the state of resistance, because there's more presence in you, not complete mind identification anymore. And through increasing presence, you can detect much more quickly the states of no, which are all, always result in suffering and unhappiness. And so you detect the no, see, and you see it. Oh, there's another no. And there's the suffering that goes with it. Okay. This is what is. You see the futility of the no, and the yes arises by itself. You don't have to create a yes. Just seeing the futility of the no to what is, and the yes is there. And that's you surrender. And a few minutes later, maybe another no comes in some other little situation and you detect it again, and you surrender. How long you dwell, you persist in a no, depends on your degree of presence, to some extent also on the heaviness of your pain body. That is not, anything, that not something you can do anything about. You either have a heavy pain body or a less heavy pain body. But here too, you can be present with the pain that arises through your pain body, and what can you do when it comes? There it is, there's the pain, the emotional pain. It is, it's here. What can you do? Yes. And, it, and, and yes to what arises within. And you detect it immediately as pain. If you don't detect it, the pain body becomes unhappy thought movements. And so we have an unhappy me, a personalized me, we talked about it this morning, that carries the heavy burden of human pain, accumulated human pain, and makes it into a self, a heavy self that is hard to live with. You yourself find it hard to live with, and others around you find it hard to live with. <laughs> <laughs> You're a problem to yourself and to others, to the whole world. You're one big problem. <laughs> This is not a personal insult. <laughs> you are moving out of that in any case already. But I was in my unhappy state, which was almost continuous, a walking problem. <laughs> and wherever the walking problem went, it found problems. So, surrender is the shift from the no to the yes, and so detecting the no is enough. Oh, it is. And you shift, yes. Now, some lucky ones have one enormous thing to surrender to in their lives. Most of you are not that lucky. One enormous thing would be one great disability, like the one I described with this person in the wheelchair. One great disaster, one enormous loss, something very so-called wrong in your life fr from birth, from very early on. One heavy thing and resistance mainly focusing on this one thing. And then, in a case like that, it is possible for complete surrender to happen all at once and the, the no never comes back. But most of you have to surrender to many little no's, little things arising in your life in the course of a normal day. Many little irritations, little no's, 
to what is. And that's your practice, it's fine. It just takes a little bit longer than if you were faced with one huge thing, in which case you might be unhappy for several years, could be unhappy for the rest of your life, there's no guarantee that the shift will happen, but there's a greater possibility, unless presence is arising as it is in you. So even while you're here the next few days, still detect the state of non-surrender in yourself. There it is. And then the shift happens automatically into, okay, this moment is okay, actually. It's okay. <laughs> so you re-enter the now. You lose the now, you re-enter the now. Ways of re-entering the now, alertness suddenly returns. You could suddenly become alert of sense perceptions. Oh. You've been perhaps completely unaware of your surroundings for the past few minutes or hours. There's a sharpness of suddenly, an alertness. There's the sense perceptions and the, an alert field. Or you sense your inner body, and that's immediately you enter the now. Or you feel your breathing flowing in and out. Present. You have to be now, in the now, otherwise you cannot sense your breathing. But whatever it is, it is always the state of alert presence that returns. Or you may catch yourself looking in the mirror and suddenly you see this unhappy face. <laughs> and you realize, oh, I've been in the know for the past two hours and didn't even know it. Something in you, of course, wants to continue with a no. The little mind made me wants to continue. It's an energy field, an energy form. It doesn't want to go. The pain body doesn't want to go. It wants to renew itself through your mind. So you may also detect in yourself and this is perhaps the last thing this afternoon to, to want to tell you. An element, an addictive element, almost, I use the word addictive as far as unhappiness is concerned. People carry something what one could carry something within that one could almost call an addiction to their own suffering, a refusal to let go. That's of course strongly associated with the pain body. The pain body doesn't want to go, it wants more pain. And so detecting the state of no sometimes means detecting the pleasure, so-called, that is being derived from unhappiness. It's not really pleasure. To the ego, it's pleasure. The body knows that it's pain, but the ego loves that pain because its sense of identity gets stronger in the state of unhappiness. An unhappy me is stronger than a happy me, the fictitious self. <laughs> An unhappy me is more contracted. So it's a habit. It's an addictive habit. <laughs> and that's uh, it's a, an amazing thing to detect in oneself one's addiction. And you don't have to accuse yourself as, I shouldn't be addicted. No, just to see it. This pleasure in unhappiness. This is strange. 
And then you notice that the unhappiness isn't really pleasurable at all. It's pain mistaken as pleasure. <laughs> the ego mistakes pain and pleasure. <laughs> <laughs> It's such an adventure to be engaged in this transformation of human, human consciousness. It's funny, too. If questions arise, we will uh, perhaps tomorrow and or Thursday, we will look at some questions that may arise concerning the arising of presence. Not questions like, explain to me, I haven't quite understood yet what presence is. Uh, <laughs> I need a few more explanations. Not, but uh, questions to do with perhaps the pain body in your life, or whatever. So we'll ha have time for questions tomorrow and or Thursday, and maybe even answers. We may also have a time for a silence, not compulsory, of course. We may do that tomorrow. Recommend it, a period of silence, perhaps sometime during the day tomorrow, half a day or so, and then perhaps again. Nothing here is compulsory. Some retreats are like boot camps, and you may have attended one or two of those, but this is quite gentle. <laughs> <laughs>